would uh, get started. We thought we would get started in, in the interests of time. Um, good morning from Boston and good afternoon or good evening to those of you joining us from other parts of the world. Uh, my name is Neve Gibbons. I'm with the Executive Negotiation Program at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Um, the Executive Negotiation Program is a professional development program that focuses on um, opportunities uh, for humanitarian practitioners to explore uh, negotiation and innovation um, for leaders in, leaders in the sector. Um, our program recently launched a series of workshops uh, titled Foundational Frameworks in Humanitarian Negotiation, which will be running over the course of the next year or so, both online and in a number of regional locations. Um, and this webinar today is the first in a series of webinars that we plan to schedule um, as a, a, essentially as, as a complement to the workshop series so that we can explore in more depth some of the issues that practitioners are raising during our workshops and also bring this dialogue and bring these issues and the discussion to a broader audience. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today. Um, for the first, the first webinar, we're focusing on uh, the really central issue of gender diversity and humanitarian negotiation uh, and how these, how these factors interplay with each other in a humanitarian negotiation setting. And we're joined uh, today uh, to share their perspectives by two, two leaders in the humanitarian field, uh, Joyce Luma and Reem Al-Salam, who I'll introduce in more, in more detail in a moment. Uh, I'm also joined by Emily Ng of the ENP team here at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Uh, Emily will be uh, jumping in a little bit more uh, later on in the hour uh, during the Q&A section. Uh, so for the Q&A, um, there's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of Zoom, which you're probably potentially familiar with. If you do have a question during the event, please feel free to type it in the Q&A. Emily and I will be monitoring the questions that are coming in. And we'll do our best to, to pass those on to, to our speakers. We won't be able to address all of them. And we did have some excellent questions come in from, from during the pre-registration process. So we'll, we'll do our best to get to as much as we can. Um, so I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. Um, Reem Al-Salam is an independent consultant with significant experience in humanitarian response, uh, migration, um, and early recovery. She was uh, for over 17 years with UNHCR in a, a range of conflict, post-conflict and natural disaster settings, including Darfur, Pakistan, Lebanon, Libya, and the Syria situation. Um, Reem became an independent consultant in 2013 and since then has been working with UN agencies, international NGOs, and academic centers, including our own. Um, her background has focused extensively on protection issues, um, working on gender-based violence and child protection, among others. Uh, she supported the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants for some time and was recently appointed as UN Special Rapporteur herself uh, on violence against women, its causes and consequences, although I will note that that is not the, the subject of, of our uh, webinar today. Um, our other speaker today is Joyce Luma. Joyce is currently the uh, Human Resources Director with the United Nations World Food Programme. She was previously WFP Country Director and Representative in Ethiopia and South Sudan, and served as Deputy Director of the Policy Programme and Innovation Division at WFP, holding regional positions in vulnerability analysis, mapping and nutrition in several regions, as well as working with FAO on food security and health information. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from both Joyce and Reem, um, but I'd like to start by um, looking over to Reem, um, as I know, uh, as well as your deep experience in the humanitarian sector, you have recently focused your, your research interests on uh, diversity and humanitarian negotiation. So Reem, we'd be delighted if you could share with us some of your perspectives from your experience in the sector and also uh, from, from your research. 
Well, first of all, thanks very much uh, also to the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative for having me and also for everyone who's joining us today. So uh, for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'll um, present an overview of the uh, key dimensions of diversity that influence humanitarian negotiation. As Neve mentioned, these are based uh, both on my own experience as a humanitarian for more than 20 years, but also uh, on the research that I carried out for the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiation in Switzerland a few years back, and uh, which I've summarized in a paper that was co-published uh, uh, with Rob Grace, who had also done uh, research on some of the same aspects. And we will be linking uh, the, the paper in the chat um, at the end of this uh, talk. So when it comes to any specific negotiation, I'm going to steal uh, Rob Grace's uh, quote uh, when he uh, speaks also to these issues uh, by saying that who says something is at least as important as what is being said. And what that means is that identity related characteristics do shape how humanitarians view their negotiation counterparts, but not only. It also shapes how uh, our negotiation counterparts view us, the humanitarian negotiator, also based on their own experiences and identity characteristics. And since these are very personal characteristics and experiences, and since they also interact in very specific contexts, we can of course see quite easily how bias comes in and how it can flow in the two directions. That means from the humanitarian to the counterpart, but also the counterpart to the humanitarian. So one of the key issues I want to, uh, or dimensions uh, related to diversity I want to explore is the issue of gender. Um, so if we look at gender, gender of course can impact a negotiation, not only um, uh, the counterpart's perception of gender, but also the capacities that the negotiator brings to bear that might be linked to one's own gender identity. So my experience uh, as, a, as a woman negotiator, but also uh, the research that uh, we conducted shows that being a woman in itself does not make it easier or more difficult to negotiate even in settings that may be considered as conservative or um, uh, not encouraging of gender equality, um, not encouraging of full uh, participation by women. Now, what we found is that gender can become an aggravating factor when it is combined with other dimensions of a negotiator's profile. So for example, if you have a woman negotiator, but she's also young, then these two elements combined may, for example, make it challenging for her. Or for example, if you have a woman um, that is both local and unmarried, that could be in some settings, uh, you know, more challenging for her. Uh, now that of course um, uh, is also uh, dependent on um, how the, the, the armed group or the counterpart that you're negotiating with uh, views the woman's adherence to uh, local norms or her respect for local norms. That seems to also matter quite a bit. So what my experiences and also the research that we've done shows is that while female negotiators may be confronted with an initial set of biases by their counterparts and therefore initial set of difficulties, uh, female negotiators, including myself, we've been able to overcome uh, these difficulties. So even in culturally conservative contexts, actually gender is a surmountable challenge to be navigated rather than a definite uh, impediment. It has long been recognized that female negotiators can gather information more holistically and fully than their male counterparts as they have more access to and can speak to the entire population that is affected by a conflict or a natural disaster, including women and children. But that is not the only way in which being a woman, a woman can be a distinctive advantage. In particular, a woman can be in a better negotiating position because she can disarm her counterpart. She might not project the same sheer force or flex muscles like a man. And therefore, initially, she might also appear less threatening. Now, also because the counterpart may have his or her certain biases about the woman's uh, negotiator skills, experience or expertise, 
she can also sometimes use the surprise factor, which can unsettle the counterpart. And I've used that personally in, in many negotiation settings where I've walked into situations and my counterpart assumed just that just because I'm a woman, uh, my experience did not include conflict. I have not had uh, experience negotiating with armed groups or, or, or militant groups. And uh, when they realize that this experience is there, um, sometimes they don't know how to react. And, and that can sometimes work in your favor. Now, regardless of the position that some counterparts may have, it is important for humanitarian organizations to continue to include female negotiators in their teams, even if it might be a little bit complicated to insist on this inclusiveness. And uh, this is to speak to the question we have about how do you then you know, encourage female negotiators, even in contexts like Afghanistan? Because it's very important, I feel, that we do not become accomplices in the counterparts' biases and reductionary behaviors towards women. So we have to continue to make that effort. That said, I want to also stress that both my experience and research have shown that sexist, patriarchal, or even misogynist behavior remains prevalent inside many organizations, including humanitarian organizations. So that has required female negotiators and myself to have thick skin so that we are not discouraged by such behavior and to insist on being taken seriously and treated fairly. And I think I speak for many female negotiators when I say that we often were judged uh, by a different yardstick from our fellow male negotiator, which of course has created a lot of pressure on us, both personal and professional. And I dare say also that some women uh, in senior roles in humanitarian organizations also perpetuate this dynamic uh, since they want to be seen as part of the boys club. And so, uh, you know, also may uh, undermine uh, fellow female negotiators either consciously uh, or unconsciously. Now, since gender identity goes beyond just uh, the, the issue of, you know, being a woman, I would also like to stress that LGTBI negotiators face uh, another very specific set of challenges particularly in countries where certain sexual and gender identities are outlawed. So for example, um, other than you having certain uh, you know, sexual orientations that may not be acceptable in the host country, or you being a member of the LGTBI community, even a, a humanitarian negotiator that could be seen as championing or supporting LGTBI issues in some context uh, could you know, suffer consequences for that. So it's, it's something that needs to be navigated uh, carefully. Now, obviously, expressing a non-binary gender identity or diverse sexual orientation in some contexts um, uh, can be dangerous for the humanitarian negotiator as, as much as it can be also problematic for the negotiation process. And these elements have to be taken into consideration and balanced against the principles of equity and fairness in the hiring process so that also LGBTI humanitarian negotiators are not disadvantaged because of their identity or sexual orientation. And again, also to uh, you know, stress upon universal principles and, and standards of inclusiveness, equal rights. Uh, so that's something you know, we, we should not shy away from. Something very quickly also I wanted to touch upon as an important element is nationality. Uh, it does influence uh, the negotiation process, the nationality you may have as a negotiator. And sometimes belonging to a country that does not trigger strong negative reactions or that is associated with a positive impression in the counterpart's mind can be useful. Same goes for uh, culture and religious identities. Uh, here, the, the really the overriding factor is that they, they should not be oversimplified. So just to give an example, you know, assuming that uh, you know, sending a Muslim negotiator to any Muslim majority country you know is, is a plus is, is an oversimplification because it doesn't also take into consideration perhaps the the, the different divisions in in, in a muslim uh, country uh, sectarial divisions and so you know it, it it has the analysis has to go beyond these uh, oversimplified uh, approaches and many people assume that cultural understanding and awareness is something that can be learned quickly when in fact it isn't it's often uh, the things that we cannot see and the things that are not spoken that matter. And these are things that take time to observe and understand. 
very quickly also to, to speak about the issue of skin color. That's something that came uh, up in our, in our research and uh, that can influence the perception of a counterpart in some regions. So for example, in the MENA region, the research that we've done has shown that counterparts all too often assume that negotiators with darker skin colors are junior members of the team. Um, we're not saying it's right or wrong, but it seems to, to play uh, you know, a role. And uh, in the MENA region, the color of one's skin had an impact as it can influence the counterpart's perception. And they assume that, um, that for example, as, as one, re, uh, one key informant we've interviewed for the research said, um, that one had to be of the right color of dark in order to be taken seriously. And it's, it's, it's a very unfortunate, obviously, finding. Uh, language also influences negotiation as it's often to assume that language barriers or working through translators is a negative issue, though of course it's not always so. Working through a translator can, for example, also allow you to buy time or think about uh, your responses. Uh, a very final issue I would like to uh, touch upon is the local versus the international, because any discussion on the impact of diversity in negotiations would be incomplete if I didn't mention the influence of one's identity as a local versus an international humanitarian negotiator. Because being a local humanitarian negotiator is certainly more challenging than being an international one, um, because you are constantly negotiating space and legitimacy. Now, local humanitarian negotiators have to constantly pull out and use the elements they have up their sleeve that they might uh, find helpful in a negotiation. For example, dropping the name of their family or a relative who is in the right position or their work experience or their links to a certain area that is the subject of the negotiation. But while they do this, they have to keep a very fine balance since they have to convey both legitimacy, but also a certain distance from the local dynamics. They have to also uh, continue to convey a certain degree of impartiality without uh, you know, uh, breaking an opportunity to build confidence and to build relations. Not that internationals don't confront this challenge, but uh, we all know that you know, when it goes sour for an international humanitarian negotiator, they still have an option to be pulled out, to be reassigned, to leave the country, something that is a lot more difficult for uh, national humanitarian negotiators and also their staff. So these considerations weigh more heavily uh, on the national staff. And uh, just to close on this issue is that, of course, national staff do not only have to manage the perception by uh, their counterparts, but also uh, the perception that may exist inside their own organization by their international colleagues and peers and supervisors who uh, uh, may see them potentially as biased in a conflict or negotiation situation, or who may assume that just because they're national staff, they may have less skills than their international um, peer. So um, I will leave it at that and uh, happy to also uh, answer any questions uh, Yeah, and hear the comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Reem, for those important, really important insights and great breadth of, of experience that you've clearly brought to this, brought to this topic and this discussion. Um, I, I'd like to hand it over to Joyce now. Um, Joyce, you are currently the Human Resources Director with the World Food, Food Programme, one of the world's largest humanitarian agencies, and you were previously a country director for WFP. Uh, in several countries. Um, so it would be great if you could share with us some of your main experiences and perceptions uh, related to these issues in the sector. Thank you and uh, good morning everybody. It's good afternoon from where I'm sitting. Um, maybe just a little background first. Um, uh, in 2019, 54 countries were engaged in active conflict and we've seen that the number of uh, uh, protracted crises have doubled in the last 15 years. We have somewhere around 34 uh, protracted crises uh, in, in, in 2020. And then we have somewhere around 1.6 billion people living in conflict affected, affected countries, 426 million children living in these conflict zones. And then of course we know that you know, these are the most vulnerable people. We, we saw most recently, that uh, we had uh, four concurrent uh, famines in 2017, 
And all these happened in countries where access to po populations were restricted. So I work for WFP, you know, as, as, as I was introduced, uh, one of our largest humanitarian organization. We, we have um, our 10 largest operations are in conflict uh, uh, affected countries. In fact, if I count, there are made more than 10 uh, conflict aff affected countries where we operate. I have worked in two of these of the largest operation. I need to say that my early work in WFP, I did not start off, you know, to go and work as, as, a, as a negotiator. My early work in, in WFP was directing food security analysis, identifying the most food insecure hotspots and ensuring that those areas received uh, food assistance. So my, my, my work really had been always about ensuring that humanitarian as, assistance was directed to the most needy areas and the most uh, uh, insecure population. Um, and then I think, you know, during the course of my work, I was encouraged to apply for a leadership position in one of the largest operations. I must say, I had a lot of self-doubt when I was tapped, you know, to, to, to lead. I just didn't think I had the profile for it. So uh, what does that say about women? You know, we know that we, they are disproportionate if you are women working in conflict affected uh, countries across the humanitarian organization. And this is just not in leadership positions, but at all levels. And within the UN, there is currently, you know, the, the, the UN Secretary General uh, Guterres is really driving the effort of increasing the number of women across not just in conflict effect, but across the board where we work. And yet we have seen that that increase in the number of women over the years has been so painfully slow. And if I can illustrate from our, my own organization where we are trying to drive hard to increase the number of women, we are making such really painfully slow progress. Uh, in, when I was in South Sudan, where there are just about 22% of women in, in, in 2016, 2017, when I was there, <laughs> driving hard now with somewhere around 25%. So it's really painfully slow. So overall in conflict affected countries, we have seen, even though the, the increase of women in humanitarian settings has increased, but it's lowest in conflict affected countries. And why is that important? Access negotiation is just not, you know, the country director like I was. It takes place at different levels. You know, Reem talked about national staff. They play an important role in ensuring that we're able to access, uh, you know, the most vulnerable. It may be, in fact, going to a community, having those dis discussions with actors to ensure that we are able to reach uh, the most vulnerable, and it is women you know, it would be a, a, a woman um, food aid monitor in our context, you know, driving that discussion. And so really having more women in these humanitarian contests increases uh, uh, the involvement of women in negotiations. We've seen globally that 13% uh, of peace negotiations involve women, and yet studies show that negotiations that involve women tend to last longer. So the law, representation of women in these settings is reflected, for me as I see it, is reflected in the low proportions of uh, uh, negotiations uh, carried out by women. So quickly, and, and, and Reem touched, touched on this, um, how is gender di and, and diversity, you know, uh, uh, you know, treated in humanitarian uh, negotiation? First and foremost, um, we see that women, we have a different style in, in, you know, from men. Um, we seem to, you know, women are seen to more likely compromise and therefore reach much longer lasting peace. But that's not necessary to say that they are easy negotiators. I think it depends from one woman to another. You know, negotiations for access, in my opinion, is about ensuring that the humanitarian assistance is reached, it reaches the most vulnerable populations and especially those children behind those, those uh, battle lines. Women, in my opinion, are seen to be less, uh, less threatening to armed actors 
and therefore we're able to speak uh, on behalf of vulnerable women beyond those battle bands. It is important to be equipped with good data and, and to be able to back that negotiation, data on nutrition. It is also important in any negotiations to be reassuring, reassuring the armed actors that you're not taking sides in the conflict and your mission is about humanity. I found you know, that um, citing the four humanitarian principle was really critical. And then of course you can, you can back, you know, you can back those humanitarian principles with data to be able to, to be convinced. So know your humanitarian principles if you're going to be negotiating. As an African, and and, and Rim talked about, you know, um, nationality, color, and, and so forth. For me, as an African woman, I found I was easily accepted in some set settings and seen to be, of course, you know, less threatening. You know, but I also was seen not to, um, to have a Western agenda. In some cases, I was also accepted because I was seen to be, to have been equally oppressed and therefore, you know, accepted easily. Uh, and this was the case, not only in South Sudan, but also in Asia, you know, you were also oppressed, you were colonized like us, and therefore it was an entry a point to have those conversations. And so you can use that as a way to be able to discuss difficult issues without having a label. In the context of South Sudan, for instance, I was particularly accepted because of the country I came, I came from. I come from Zambia. Zambia was one of the countries that was supportive of the freedom uh, struggle of South Sudanese. And so I was, you know, I could have those difficult dis discussions with, uh, with government and actors, but I was seen as one of them, one that supported the freedom of that country. And so that, that worked, uh, you know, to my advantage. Rim talked about religion and, and that I think is an important part we found, for instance, in, in some parts of South Sudan where we couldn't even reach because the tension was just, was just so much. We were seeking to have a religious leader join uh, you know, our negotiation group because we could not just go in. Um, and, and so religion sometimes can, you know, can for communities where religion is important, you could use uh, religious leaders to be able to, to help through and navigate through those uh, uh, difficult discussions. So while gender, nationality, ethnicity, and all these can be an, uh, uh, an advantage, they can also be a disadvantage, you know, because uh, sometimes women are not taken so seriously and alone, let alone a woman of color may not be you know, taken even more seriously. So I think for me, I think what is important is you know, build a team of negotiators in any country. It's not one single person, but a diverse team that you can pull depending on the context. And you may need to deploy one or two people to go to a context to, to, to go and ne negotiate, but not just rely on, on one. I would also say, say that it's also important to be able to invest time in understanding uh, the authorities, the state or armed actors and the power networks, um, you know, to be able to, uh, to negotiate. For instance, we had found in South Sudan as we were going down to, uh, to uh, trying to negotiate our, our, our way down to an area, we found it was not one group. We had found there were different armed actors and therefore their demands were going to be different. And therefore for every roadblock that we found, we had to negotiate our way through. So know your power uh, uh, dynamics. Maybe just quickly, let me just um, talk about how we can advance uh, women negotiators uh, to take a lead. As I started, I did say in my case, I was encouraged to lead. I was, you know, I had not start off as a, as, an, as a humanitarian negotiator. I was tapped, I was encouraged to apply. I was encouraged to apply by another woman. And so we women, I must say, we have, a, we have an important role to play to encourage other women. So I, I had a sponsor, I should say, in, in, in that contest. I didn't think I had the profile for senior leadership position 
until that discussion with our executive director, who's a woman. We tend, to, women tend to have our self doubt, uh, especially when they're applying in positions that are male dominated. If, as, as, I, as I mentioned, we women leaders who have been there, we have a role to play to encourage you know, the young women who aspire to lead in the organization. Also, we have a role to play in uh, identifying talent and inspiring and guiding as well as mentoring. Um, as well as mentoring you know, those young leaders. And um, maybe just also an example in terms of my case in you know, taking up the leadership role in South Sudan. You know, after I was taught, I continued to have self-doubt. I had to go and talk to other friends who say, you can do it, you can do it. But I also, what was important for me, I enlisted a mentor, a senior staff with remarkable emergency experience as a mentor to support me. So mentorship is also important as we try to, to support, you know, uh, you know, young people who aspire to take a uh, leadership role. And then finally, I would say, you know, we, the, the organizations themselves have also to have a, a role to play in setting clear policy frameworks, supporting women, and also having uh, strengthened supporting uh, systems within the organization. A bit of affirmative action too in hiring and the recruitment process to increase the representation of women. I think if we have more women on the ground, you know, we'll have uh, an increase in women in 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 uh, negotiations. But finally, I need to say, you know, you can do all those things, but women themselves have to step up and be ready to take that challenge. So let me take a pause here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, thank you both. Um, but thank you in particular, Joyce, for uh, sharing your, your personal experiences um, and also your perspectives uh, in your current role. Um, yeah, I think we, we have some questions coming in through the, through the Q&A function, um, but maybe um, just in advance of that, um, Joyce, I know you talked a little bit, this is based on questions that came in from some of our participants in advance of the, in advance of the webinar. Um, you talked a little bit, Joyce, about different, about things that organizations can do to better support negotiators from diverse backgrounds. So depending on what the, what the setting is. Um, so specifically supporting them to be more effective in negotiations. Um, so I just wonder if either of you have uh, any points to add on that. So point, uh, you know, uh, what organizations can do to better support their uh, negotiators. Reem, maybe I'll uh, put that question to, to you first since I know Joyce uh, touched on it a little bit in her presentation. Well, I'm not anymore uh, on the inside of any uh, organization, but as a consultant, I work frequently with organizations and I feel that there's uh, been a lot of soul searching and a lot of um, very conscious effort to try to find ways to leverage the diversity of the staff of uh, organizations. Um, so on the inside of the organizations to look at uh, also human resource policies, um, to look at um, ways of managing staff in a way that can be, you know, can do more justice to, to different uh, workforce, uh, irrespective of their background. Um, and also between organizations, so if I may mention, I mean, the courses you're trying to put in place, also the CCHN, the Center of Competence, is a, a multi-organization initiative that was conceived in order to, to give um, uh, also safe space to humanitarian negotiators to come together to discuss these very complex issues in, in a safe environment, um, but also to learn from each other. I think this is another thing that was recognized that there is so much knowledge inside the organizations that is not properly uh, maximized, not properly shared. And so also how to create communities of practice and allow for uh, humanitarian negotiators to come together and share experiences also across organizations.
Thank you, Reem. Um, Joyce, did you have anything to add on that point? Yes, I have. I, I think, you know, first and foremost, I think, you know, uh, recruitment, uh, the drive to have more women. Uh, we just need to have more women in, in this context, you know, because negotiation, as I did say, you know, takes place at different levels. There is also, in my organization, we realize that we don't have enough women in, in, in humanitarian contexts, and, and especially at the leadership level. And so what we have done, you know, for instance, we, currently we only have, out of the 10 largest countries, we only have one woman who's leading in Afghanistan, in fact. Yeah, our country director is a woman. And we're basically saying we need to prepare more women into these leadership positions. And we're starting from a low level. So what we have done is to increase the number of women who are going in the deputy country director position and pairing them up into, into and preparing them to, to get into the most senior uh, positions. And in the last uh, couple of years, we have just increased the number of women in these uh, deputy positions, but preparing them into the most senior level positions. So we have also, you know, training, leadership development programs, mentor, mentorship, and in fact, as I did say, as we increase the number of women in these uh, deputy positions, we're pairing them up with mentorship and coaching, you know, so that they will be the next crop of our leaders in, in, in these positions. So there's a lot that can be done, you know, to, to, to prepare. We know we're short now, but we should be ready for the future. Great, thank you both so much. Um... I know we have some more questions coming in from the Q and A. So Emily, I don't know if you are you have you picked up some that you'd like to present to Joyce and Reem, or um, I have a couple more that came in before. But by all means, go ahead if, if there's some that have come through. Yeah, absolutely, Neve, and thank you, Reem and Joyce, both for your remarks today. I did. Um, this is also coming from the pre-question group, um, but. I think it is important, especially in the era of COVID to talk about the self-care and taking care of yourself and what keeps you motivated in your own roles as female negotiators. So if you could share just a little bit about some practices you use and approaches to continue um, working in the field and what keeps you motivated um, to keep growing as negotiators, I think it would help um, some early beginner uh, negotiators that are women, and especially as they grow and encounter different challenges, how do you overcome and keep learning and growing? And that's open to either of you to start. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what keeps you motivated as a negotiator in the field? I, I think, you know, we, we sort of like touched, touched on it a bit, um, you know, First of all, I think, at least in my experience, there was a different levels, you know, women, you know, touching base with other women, what's your experience and talking to each other. There was almost a, a support group to be able to learn from each other. And, and that was always uh, very, very useful in, 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 in just checking in with others who are, who are dealing with similar experience. But you know these settings are, 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 you know, I did say these are difficult settings. You have to have also interest outside work. I, I was, <laughs> I need to say, I'm a runner. I ran in Juba in my compound, and I did, you know, and so find something, you know, if you have um, an interest in something outside work, you know, continue with that. You know, it may be reading. We had also, I organized, for instance, um, uh, movie sessions to try to get, if you live in a compound, as most of those settings are, you know, there are many other things that you can do outside work, you know, because it's uh, demotivating for most people. After work, you go to your little room and that's, you know, so it's back to work and back to work. So there's a lot of things that you can do outside work because in most cases, when you're in that setting, most of you are in the same situation. So there's a lot of things that you can do with colleagues. Uh, you know, it can be cooking, you can be inviting each other to cooking. And as well as, of course, you know, there's also for us in, in the organization, there's a lot of learning materials 
that we have also put on our website to encourage those that want to continue to grow in this field. So there is a lot of, you know, uh, reading material, training materials that you can hook up and, you know, but remember the self-care is important. It's not only work, it can be very, very stressful in this context. So you need also to have some interest outside work to be able just to balance that, uh, that work-life balance, which can be very, very hard in this uh, context. Yes, I fully agree with what Joyce uh, said then, so I don't want to repeat uh, perhaps what uh, to add to what she said. Um, there's no doubt that the, the work can be uh, so stressful and very demanding and takes over your life that you would not continue to be motivated unless you really believed in what you're doing uh, and unless you also saw the impact of what you're doing. I think, uh, you know, all the failures that I may have experienced, let's say in a week, you know, disappear uh, by one instance where I can concretely see that I've helped someone. And so it's, it's things like these, these small victories that, that keep you going. Um, at the same time, and as I said, I have not seen that any of my characteristics, whether it be my nationality, being a woman, being young, has, has been um, sort of a deal breaker or has been a, a very unsurmountable starting point. Um, so I, I saw that also I can uh, learn and there are ways to navigate um, that with my limitations, but also the, the sort of the pluses that I bring to a situation and that I just had to learn uh, you know, how to play my cards because it's all cards that are up your sleeve. And then depending on the situation, you become more, let's say, experienced knowing what to pull out, how to help yourself, how to help a situation. And of course, you learn that by, by doing, but you learn that also, as Joyce said, by observing and learning from other experienced colleagues and peers, including, you know, uh, experienced women negotiators who have also become friends. Um, but also, frankly, by uh, learning by observing, yeah? So being humble about what you know and you don't know, uh, not pretending that because you arrived in a country and you're supposed to be in a humanitarian and helping people that you know it all, you actually know very little, if anything at all. So, so it's also taking time to observe, to understand the setting, uh, to, to understand how people perceive you, uh, the different counterparts, the affected communities, uh, and, uh, and to not to forget to reflect, actually, because this pay, work can be very fast paced, and we often jump into just an automatic pilot uh, sort of uh, situation, and we forget to reflect and to pause and to think, is this actually the right thing to do? Is it right because we've always done it like that or because it actually helps the context? So, so these are also some of the ways. We have an, a number of uh, questions coming in uh, about uh, an issue that I think you Reem touched on a little bit about being LGBTQ plus in the humanitarian sector. And some of the, you know, the security concerns potentially, or um, at least perception issues that this that this raises. Um, and it, it also relates to a question that was put to us before the event, which is during a negotiation, um, is there scope to sort of challenge an interlocutor's perceptions or to sort of inform them that certain um, identity groups are, are, are entitled to protection while also prioritizing the, um, the goals of the, the, the goal of the negotiation, which may be access or, or something different. So I, I hope that makes sense. But if either of you have, uh, have thoughts on that, that would be very helpful. So I've tried to address some of these questions in the chat. I hope uh, the answers I've provided are helpful. Uh, my take on this from what I've seen is that, and I've worked with very experienced, skillful LGTBI humanitarian negotiators, you know, that, that are just like, obviously the rest of us, irrespective of, you know, their gender or sexual 
orientation and therefore uh, you know would would face the same kind of um, uh, enabling uh, factors, but also challenges. I I I feel, but again, maybe it sh this question should be posed to to someone from that community. That it's not again a deal breaker in itself. That it depends on the context. That it depends also on you know the possibilities for navigating uh, and expressing their sexual identity and their gender identity in public versus uh, private sphere. In some countries, there is more room to you know. Uh, to, to live that identity fully in as long as it's, you know, very private. In others, even that is not possible. So, so then it comes at the expense of, of the humanitarian negotiator. But um, I, I would say that I haven't seen this uh, to be an element that basically sort of overshadows everything else about the humanitarian negotiator. And of course, this just like, for example, um, putting yourself in uh, to protect women's rights in certain contexts, you know, is not something that will happen overnight. It's not something for which there is an easy fix or even an easy strategy. It will often take years. It will take uh, a collective approach. It will take, uh, uh, you know, strategizing and re-strategizing and identifying openings and, and, you know, mapping out stakeholders and seeing who else can put pressure. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole, um, it's a whole uh, actually um, issue on its own that, you know, that, uh, that, that has to be fleshed out and thought about. So I think it is possible, but if you expect it to be a quick fix and, you uh, and something that can happen overnight or something that uh, you can raise uh, directly uh, with many interlocutors, like very sort of, uh, you know, bang your ha hand on the table and say, oh, the, this, the rights should be protected. It doesn't unfortunately work like that in many settings. Thank you so much, Reem. Uh, Emily, do you have other questions coming in from the chat? Yeah, so we just have a few questions um, coming in around, you know, approaches and the different resources and tools. Maybe um, if you could both speak to a little bit about uh, what uh, skills and different um, trainings and different development opportunities you sees to grow um, in learning different negotiation approaches. And also as a woman, um, maybe talk about some successes you've had in those negotiations that was, ad you became more advantageous because of your gender. Um, so just hearing a little bit more about your experiences and specific tools, I think would be great. Go ahead, Joyce. <laughs> I, 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 I think, you know, from approaches and different tools and um, I, I think, you know, because I come from I, my background, having had uh, for security analysis was my background in research and so forth. So really, you know, um, understanding the issues, understanding the context and as, you know, and using data to be able to make a case you know, was, was something that I, I you know, I, I used a lot. And I, I'll give an example, for instance, in the, um, in South Sudan, when I was uh, the country director, we, there was really that active conflict just in the urban center and we were looted massively and we lost a lot of our resources. And, and we knew that uh, it was, uh, the government was in charge and you know, so on, and, and it was believed that the army was involved. So I, I went to see the chief of staff of the armed, uh, um, the, the armed uh, services. And in my discussion there, you know, my starting point was, we have been in this country for a long, long time. And we have been working for, you know, saving your population for a long, long time. We have prevented funding for a long, long time. You know us, and you know our work. And I can't believe, you know, that you know the army would be the one that would loot us and loot us in that sense. And that shook him. I recall just that, you know, he was moved in terms of that discussion. And and I I I, 
I go back now and, and think about that discussion in terms of, of course, I think if I was a man and, you know, we wouldn't have had that discussion at that level. But it's about really, you know, putting the data, understanding the context and, and using it in a way that really, and, and in fact, I think offered to, to, uh, to investigate and follow up and, you know, uh, similarly, I, I, I had a staff member who was taken and was going to be killed and I flew to that, to that uh, um, region and, and again, you know, I studied my humanitarian principles and the humanitarian law and I went there and I said, you can't take him. First you didn't, you know, and I used that. And so the data, understand the context, understand who you're talking to is critical in any negotiation. And, and of course, you know, uh, sometimes being a woman at that time, you know, can be disarming because I was, I'm not threatening, I was less threatening and it was a conversation. And I'd given the history of our, of our support in that country. And basically saying, you know, we have saved this country for so many years and, you know, I can't believe you do something like that. So, um, you know, so I, I use data, I use hard facts, and of course, you know, you need to know the person that you're speaking to and, and the, the power dynamics. And, you know, so that's, I think, my advice. That was the approach, at least in, in those contexts. And it, it, it depends, you know, how you're going to do that will depend from one context to another. It won't work in all contexts, but you have to be able to understand particular contexts. And, and, and get as much information as possible to be able to engage. Like Joyce has uh, already mentioned, um, I see my gender as one of many attributes I have that can either benefit me in a specific context or can potentially actually take me back or, or be a, a, a disabling factor. And with time and experience, you develop this um, awareness and this emotional intelligence, if I may call it like that, you can already anticipate in advance which element in your identity or your profile is going to work for you or against you. And so in that setting, I try therefore to uh, anticipate uh, that in advance if I can or during a negotiation and then offset the negative impact. So I'll, I'll give an example. So as, as Joyce also shared, uh, I found that in many places, uh, my nationality is a plus. Uh, it's a plus, for example, in Central America or in Eastern Europe where, you know, uh, uh, coming from the Middle East is so far removed that it really is, is seen as neutral, as not possibly having an impact on, you know, the geopolitics of an intervention, including a humanitarian intervention. Uh, I'm also aware that sometimes I walk into, uh, let's say, a Muslim majority country, and, and though I may be Muslim, you know, I might be perceived as too westernized because I have short hair, because I don't wear the veil, because, because, because. And I try then to offset that in a negotiation by showing a that I um, I know the culture, you know, either through words I use or making references to concepts, or also making reference to religious uh, concepts and 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 frameworks and, and and Sharia law, for example, you know. So so then I want to portray to my counterpart that. Uh, don't be fooled by appearances. I actually know what I'm talking about and I understand the concern that you have or understand the framework that you're referring to. And I understand it very well, I've studied it. So it's, this becomes sort of, uh, you become better at it with time. But as I said, you have to also be open to learning that. You have to conscientiously cultivate that skill because not everybody cultivates it. And you will sometimes get it wrong because you, you also learn by doing, right? So, so of course you sometimes get it wrong an approach you try might backfire. And, and that's why also working in a negotiation as a team is so important because the person who does the talking, you know, the others, their job, part of their job is to observe 
uh, and, and also to provide you, you input. And that's why also relying on your local staff is so important because they will inject elements into your strategy or into your approach that you might not be aware of because you don't come from there. So you have to also you know, work on any negotiation as a team and not just rely on yourself. It's not a one man show, uh, this kind of work. Thank you. I think maybe you have time for one more question, Neve, if you have one, and if not, we can probably close for today. Um, I think maybe I would just ask one last question, um, which is actually about um, maybe more so focusing on the goals of the of a negotiation. Um, so looking at um, how humanitarian actors negotiate for the protection of women and minorities um, in emergency settings. And I know this is obviously, this, this was on the forefront of uh, several of our participants' minds, I think because of watching the situation in Afghanistan over the last few weeks and concerns about the welfare and protection of women there um, in the future. Uh, so if you have thoughts on that, you know, how, how do you interact with the community or with interlocutors when actually the goal of the program is specific to, uh, to women or gender issues? I'm sorry if that's too big of a question to finish up the webinar with. <laughs> okay, let me, let, me, let me start. I think, you know, from my perspective, of course, I, I, I work for a humanitarian organization that provides food assistance. So, so for, for me, the goal is to be able to reach the most vulnerable populations and women and children are the most critical ones. So I, you know, and having an idea, I did talk about, you know, having that data, I go to areas where you, know, you have the highest levels of food insecurity and nutrition and so forth. And being able to speak to, you know, that's critical. People are going to die. And these are, you know, and speak to those because your goal is to reach them so that you can provide assistance so that you know, their situation doesn't really you know, um, you know, uh, deteriorate. So that's my goal, to be able to reach and provide that assistance so that I can prevent the crisis from getting worse and, and reaching them and being able to say, I only want to reach the women and children to be able to provide assistance. I'm not doing anything else. Cite your humanitarian principles. I'm not engaging in anything else. It's for humanity. That's for me, I think that's always been the goal. Yeah, it's, it's work that uh, needs to happen at different levels, so not, it's not a tunnel vision approach. Uh, there's so much that can be done and you can still work on when it comes to, you know, changing legal um, sort of frameworks, but also changing social norms, again, a long-term process, helping victims, people that are now today under threat or fearing for their lives, uh, empowering women and, and girls, uh, empowering their organizations, uh, empowering their access to livelihood, to assistance. So, so it's, it includes many pieces of the puzzle. And um, on, on at least a good part of these uh, work is possible, even if it's, you know, if, if, if not on everything, but on, on many pieces of these possible, there is room for humanitarians to work even in the most challenging circumstances. Thank you both. I, I think that's been a recurring theme in several of our of aspects of the discussion. Some of this is long-term work um, and some of it is work that's already underway in organizations, in training programs like ours um, and through the research and the, the work that you're both doing in, in your own roles as well. Um, so I think we're, I think we're, more or less at time. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today as participants. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank Reem, Joyce and Emily um, for, for your help and for your really uh, fascinating and, and such important uh, contributions. Um, I know we didn't get to address all of the questions that came in. Um, Emily has put in the chat uh, a link to an article that we mentioned that she had recently published um, 
and also a link to our workshop training page so to the to the website where you can get some more information about our trainings um, but also sign up for a uh, for an interest list to get information about future programs uh, or send us an email if there was any question or feedback that you that you had after this event uh, so i'd like to close by just thanking everyone emily did you have any last uh, comments yeah, I also just wanted to say that you'll have an opportunity to complete a post event survey. So we would love to hear from you about how you enjoyed today's webinar and then potentially if you have any ideas for future topics related to humanitarian negotiation, um, please enter and fill out the survey. We'd appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you everyone again. Reem or Joyce, did you have any last comments? Thank you again for organizing this and thank you to the participants for the very interesting questions and very thought provoking. Thank you. I think likewise, you know, thank you for inviting me and, and thank you for, for the discussion. It was really a pleasure. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye from Boston. Thank you.